Um, okay, so let me get to introducing Dr. Radonovich. So we have Dr. Kristen Radonovich. She is the newly named director of the Neurodevelopment Center, NDC for short, if you've heard of it. Uh, we work very closely with them. And so how new? Like within the last- December 1st. Okay. Yeah, very new. So fabulous. She's already entwined uh, with us. Right, I like that. Um, sharing her uh, expertise, she's on our five-year grant. I mentioned a little bit in the Connect. Um, there's a couple of domains, largely in health and wellness. She, her work adds the research component as well as direct service in many ways. So I won't steal any of her thunder. I know you're talking about some of that, but a couple of different ways. Yeah, and then also director of neuropsychology. Pediatric. Uh, the pediatric neuropsychology. So she's very involved. Uh, I met her through pediatrics at first and then here and then in DC. It's a lot of different places, but she can tell you more about that. We appreciate you taking your time and being here. All right. With Thanks us. for having me. With that, I'll turn it over to you and we can okay, so minimize that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That should take it off and then your slides are up there. And can everyone see those slides as she switches? If you don't mind to put it in the chat and I'll get on my phone. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that welcome, Leslie. Um, it's uh, good to be here. I kind of think of this as my talk of what I've, I've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, so like Leslie said, I've gotten involved in the five-year project. So I've got a couple of different um, things I've been working on that I'm going to talk about, kind of time together loosely. But in general, what I, like she suggested, is I bring some research, research methodology to the delivery of clinical care and um, health and wellness um, projects. Oh, not All right. Okay. So basically, my projects here and more broadly are around the area of autism, autism spectrum disorders, and movement. Um, so one of the projects that I'm doing here with y'all is uh, a project looking at improving screening for autism spectrum disorder in primary care settings. Um, then there's a health and wellness project that I'm working on that involves uh, expansion of services and recreation using dance and dance related activities for children with autism and other developmental disabilities. Um, and then we're also looking at a project that I'm gonna tell you about that's specifically using dance as an intervention to improve uh, movement, functioning, cognition and social interaction in, in kids with developmental disabilities. Oh, oh, well, I don't, I'm okay. Sorry. You sure? Yeah, okay. Sorry. She's telling me I have to multitask and you don't have to letting people in. <laughs> Put you to work. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, bear with me. If I pause, I'm not having a stroke. Just trying to get to that. <laughs> okay, officially, we have some of our objectives for today. So, my objectives focus largely on the primary care project that we're doing. I'm very excited about that um, and um, our next steps for that. So, that is specifically around autism spectrum disorder, how it might present in a primary care setting, what do you do if it presents in the primary care setting and then looking a little bit at some of the technology interventions that um, uh, I'm researching. Okay, so as most of us know, if you work in this population at all, that um, the rates of autism spectrum disorder are very high. Um, and so uh, a lot of our schools, communities, physicians, other care providers, dentists, hairdressers, we are all interacting with individuals on the spectrum every day. Um, so this isn't just something that the NDC needs to know about. This is something that touches everybody. Um, the most recent 
uh, rates uh, reported by the CDC are now one in 36. So by the age of eight, one in 36 kids have been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. So this is becoming a public health emergency. Um, and if you look at currently our wait list at the NDC is 600. So there is a great need out there. There's a lot of misinformation, confusion about what is autism, what is not autism. So in an attempt to better educate our community providers, we started this project. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends formal screening of children for autism at 18 and 24 months. And this has been their guidance for many, many years. Um, but what we find is that healthcare professionals aren't generally doing that. They are not systematically screening every kid that comes into their clinic. Most often what we find is that once the family says something about it, then the pediatrician or primary care provider does the formal screening. What we do know is that using some formal screening measures, we can talk about what those might look like, are more effective in sending appropriate referrals than just clinical judgment. Um, I call it the haptic test, meaning like, ooh, they feel autistic. Um, even I um, was talking with our students today, I've been almost exclusively working with this population for 25 years. This is what I do every single day is autism diagnoses. And I still work hard to withhold judgment until I've completed my evaluation because that gut reaction, that first reaction isn't always right. So this is why we need some formal methods of how do we screen and uh, make decisions about next steps. Uh, so what we do know from the literature is that the earliest signs of um, autism or ASD, as I'll call it from now on, out, um, appear as early as 12 to 14 months of age. So very early on, we can start looking for this. And what we do know is that a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis that is consistent can reliably be made by two years of age. So this is stuff we are able to pick up on early. Uh, and we know that early intervention is best. Um, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir on this one, but it is incredibly important that we get these kids in early, um, get diagnoses made, plug them into services because we know it is much more effective when um, started early and early by the age of two. However, what we find, though, is the average age that kids actually get diagnosed is four and a half years, and that is even worse here in West Virginia and other underserved areas where it starts to approach the average age of diagnosis is seven. Um, so that, just think about all those lost opportunities for intervention, for success, for education all those lost learning opportunities. So how is ASD diagnosed? Um, so the way the DSM-5 has it set up is it, um, it used to break down into three categories. And if you come to clinic, you'll hear me describe it as three categories. It's just the easiest way for me to explain it to families. So the original three categories were um, impairment in communication, <laughs> social interaction, and the presence of repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. And it used to be broken out in those three in the DSM. They, when they revised it, made it autism spectrum disorder, they combined social communication and social interaction. Because technically, if you look at these behaviors, they are very much linked. Communication is by its very nature social, um, and being social requires communication. So it's really hard to really tease that apart. Why do we talk? What we, we talk, we communicate to engage with another person. So that's why they, the, uh, statistically speaking, they're non-separable skills. But conceptually, for me, I find it easier to explain in terms of communication, social interaction, and repetitive behaviors for restricted interests. 
So these are the actual criteria from the DSM-5. I'm not going to bore you by reading it. You can get access to these um, on the internet. Um, but I, I think it's really important for people to be aware of how, you know, the actual diagnostic criteria, because lots of times what comes into us is saying, ooh, this might be autism, and the concerns they have, none of which are part of the diagnostic criteria. So we have our social communication category, and then we have our restricted, repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. So this is a group that um, can include what we all think of as the hand flapping and the rocking and the funny little movements. It also includes some kind of uh, rigidity or repetitiveness in maybe how they talk how they approach the world. This is the like uh, needing things a certain way, sticking to their schedule if things change. So this kind of resistance to change, this um, extreme distress. Um, and then it can include the sensory things. So sensory issues used to not be part of the diagnostic criteria at all. Now it's kind of uh, grouped into this repetitive interest because it can be like a repetitive seeking of a certain texture, or it can be excessive avoidance of sound, sight, smell, taste, touch. So primary care setting, child comes in, what are we looking for? So the first question is, what does typical development look like? Um, I had a mentor um, when I was at Johns Hopkins expert in early childhood development once said that the the normative guidelines of development are so large you could drive a truck through them so what that means it hopefully entered my waiting room um what that means is that uh walking at nine months is normal and walking at 15 months is normal that's a span of six months in a child who's one year old, that's 50% of their life difference. So there's a lot of variability in early childhood uh, development, attainment of these milestones. So this question of when should milestones be met, what is considered delayed, what is not delayed, which skills are important? Um, and then that leads to when should we refer for more evaluation and or interventions? So developmental milestones just are functional skills or age-specific tasks that most children can do by a certain age. Notice I said most, not all. There's a wide range. Um, Ignore. Okay. Children can make <laughs> Sorry. Um, so there are a lot of different milestones. We always think about when do they start talking, when do they start walking. Those are the big talky-walky. Those are the, the big two. But there's a lot more skills we can look at. Um, with regards to play, learning, uh, self-soothing, interaction, movements. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that a milestone is considered met when a child is able to perform the task without assistance. So um, that's easy to talk about with walking, like, oh, can they stand up and walk across the room without your help? But what about social interaction? What does that look like without assistance? What a lot of us do, and particularly those of us who are good at working with kids, we will scaffold the heck out of an interaction. If a child seems uncomfortable or isn't engaging, we will provide that structure for them. We will say the things, we will interpret what we think they're trying to say. Um, and when you're doing these kind of evaluations, the first thing I have to tell my students is stop talking, stop, stop trying to make it easier for the child. We scaffold the heck out of things. Okay, so generally there are five developmental do domains that we look at, um, um, particularly if you're thinking about a, a primary care setting. So we're measuring their heads, we're measuring their weight and their height, and we want to see how they're doing um, their social emotional gains, language and communication, cognitive, and then um, movement physical development. So for the purposes of this talk, we're really going to focus on the social, emotional, and the communication because those are the hallmarks of a diagnosis of autism. 
So by one year of age, I'm not going to read through all of these, but some of the things we start to see is that separation thing. Do they notice when primary parent separates? Do they cry when the parent leaves the room? Do they start to show some fear, some understanding of change? Um, one of the questions I'll ask families uh, when I'm doing an evaluation, I'm asking about their history. And then I say, oh, what was their temperament like? What, what kind of a baby were they? And they say, oh, they were a good baby. And then I followed up with, were they too good? Because you can be too good as an infant. You should be showing some distress by this point. You should be showing some fear, some anxiety. By 18 months, we might have some temper tantrums and that is okay. That is normal. Um, we uh, start to differentiate between people we know and people we don't know. Again, more of this kind of stranger anxiety, um, uh, separation anxiety. Um, they might start to explore alone, but they do that classic looking back to the parent to make sure everything is okay. By two years of age, they start to do a lot more mimicking or imitation of what other people do. They might start to imitate when mom is cleaning, you know, cleaning up in the kitchen and they're there. They start to get excited when they see other children. They recognize, oh, you are people like me, which differentiates between adults. And we have our terrible twos. Um, we show that defiant behavior, which is completely normal. Um, and we start to play with other kids, but at this point it's parallel play. We don't expect them to interact a lot, but they might have similarities. So if Johnny's playing with a car, Jimmy might come beside him and play with cars too. Usually there's some similarities to it. By three years, we're showing more turn-taking concern than what we start to call early empathy. You know, nothing like those uh, Facebook and YouTube videos when the kids come running at each other and hug. We start to see that. Um, they show a wider range of emotions. Things start to get a little more sophisticated. Um, by four, we're starting to be more interactive and make believe play character play this is when you have the dress up box that's overflowing with costumes they start to talk about what's real and what's made believe um and they're able to talk about what they're interested in by five there's this awareness of friends wanting to please friends more likely to agree with rules it's not random that formal schooling tends to start at the age of five they can start to understand that oh i do what grown-ups tell me to do prior to that well, it's anyone's uh, guess if they're going to follow what the adult wants them to do okay then as far as language communication so we call it language slash communication because we're looking at not just spoken word but all over communication so we communicate in a lot of different ways um, I like to use the example of if you took me to, you know, Mexico and I don't speak Spanish, I'm probably going to be able to ask someone where the bathroom is because I'm going to gesture, I'm going to act it out, I'm going to use my facial expressions, I'm going to point, I'm going to um, do the, I can probably communicate in a lot of different ways. So I'm a big hand talker, so you're going to see me talk with my hands. Um, you use posture. If I'm talking to you, I'm going to turn and look at you, posture, gesture, eye contact, facial expressions, back and forth, um, uh, engagement, even if someone who isn't saying verbalizing words, if they're verbalizing, um, you know, sounds, you can get into a back and forth conversation with them just with non-word sounds. So we're looking at overall communication, not just talking. So by one year, they should um, you start using some of those simple gestures like no. We know that typically the first word that kids say is no. Um, they start to uh, say mama and dada, which usually is they're just babbling. And someone goes, and may or may not have meant dada at that point, but we kind of shape it into that's what it means. Um, and they're trying to start to mimic what adults are doing. They use different tones um, to express different feelings. 
by 18 months, they should be saying several words. Um, they should start pointing. So when we look at pointing, there's pointing to say, I want that. And there's pointing to say, hey, look at that. So that this is a request. And that is a social engagement to show, be like, look, there's birds going by. Different functions of the point. By two years, um, they can start to point to pictures when their name, we're knowing our body parts, we're singing head, shoulders, knees, and toes, um, uh, things like that. By three years, they should be able to follow two to three step instructions, um, use pronouns. That's a big thing that comes up in kids who go on to get a diagnosis of ASD um, and can have some simple conversations. By four, uh, they know some basic rules of grammar. They sing songs from memory and start to uh, tell stories. And by five, they should be pretty fluent, speaking full sentences, starting to use tenses in their verbs, future tense, past tense. All right, so I'm a primary care provider. Kids coming into my office, I'm checking these developmental milestones. What are the red flags? What are the things that I should be looking for? So again, I'm not going to read through all of these for you, but by 18 months of age, when we're supposed to be doing our, our first screening for autism, these are the things that should start to get us concerned. Um, so there's that pointing, single words, um, any loss of skills. Uh, I want to make it clear to define. So people will talk about, oh, they started talking, and then at two, they lost language. Um, it is actually exceedingly rare to have a true language developmental regression. We don't define a regression unless they had at least five words that were consistently used spontaneously, independently, that are then lost. So usually what you find is maybe they were saying a couple, three, four words inconsistently, and then they kind of stop. That's not considered a language regression yeah, by definition. By two, they're not using two word phrases, um, not using items appropriately, uh, uh, motor milestones, and again, any loss of skills that they had. So we're seeing these delays. We're like, so who can give an autism diagnosis? Um, well, a pediatrician can, primary care, family practice person, they're trained. They can give a diagnosis. Uh, there are folks in birth to three who are qualified to give these diagnoses. You can go see a uh, clinical psychologist. You can see a psychiatrist. Some yeah. school psychologists are trained and competent to give uh, an autism diagnosis. Speech language therapists are, are competent to give diagnoses. And then you also have your autism specialty center like the NDC or the Neurodevelopmental Center. So, does everybody need to go to the NDC? No, no, not necessarily. These diagnoses can be made by a lot of different people. So we've talked about this all seems pretty easy, like we're looking for these things, but yet we're finding from primary care providers that eh, that's not always happening. And so what we're doing is we are uh, uh, starting a project um, right now um, where we want to try to determine what are some of the bar barriers to screening in primary care. What's getting away? What supports do they need? So many times I work with people who start to jump to intervention. They're like, oh, well, we need to do this and we need to do that before they've really defined what the problem is. I wouldn't pretend to know what someone, what a family care practitioner down in, you know, Beckley Springs, what their challenges are, you know, as someone who lives up here in Morgantown. I want to ask them, what what are, what are the issues? What are the challenges? Um, what some of the research, uh, some of this research had been done in other places. And, and what we found is lots of times that they, their knowledge, their understanding of how autism is diagnosed or what causes it or what affects it is pretty outdated. Um, and lots of times it's because they got that training, you know, back 20 years ago when they were a resident. Now they've been out in the community and things have changed. 
lots of times there's just a discomfort around bringing up, you know, a word, you know, like we used to whisper cancer, you know, uh, it can be, um, disconcerting to be the first person to bring this up to a family if they don't have any um, concerns yet or they're not aware of it. Um, time. Like, do you know how many things a pediatrician has to do in their 15-minute return visit? Um, so it's they're just doing a lot of things. Um, lack of support staff. So we're going to talk about some of the screening measures that could be implemented. Um, but if a pediatrician doesn't have the time to do all that and score it up and see if the MCHAT was elevated or not. It'd be nice to have support staff, but they don't have that. There's some diagnostic confusion. How is it dead? Do we still call it a spectrum? What's PDD, NOS? We still got people diagnosing Asperger's. Um, there's all kinds of confusion around what is autism, what is it not? And then even for those who use a screener, which is usually the MCHAT, um, but it's not well validated as a screener. The other thing is oftentimes if people do use an MCHAT, they just hand the parent the, the questionnaire and go from there. The MCHAT actually requires a two-part intervention. Nobody does the second part. It starts with the parent questionnaire. And then if that, can, that comes up as at risk, there's supposed to be an interview portion that goes with that. So that's where you can get, you can miss kids, and you can send a lot of kids to sit on a 600 person wait list for 12 to 18 months to then find out, no, this is an autism, when maybe we could have made that distinction earlier on, saved a lot of, you know, fear and anxiety as well. So, like I said, we've developed a survey to be administered to hopefully all primary care providers across West Virginia. Um, our goal is to determine perceived barriers and then to use that information to implement um, interventions to improve access to screenings and referrals. Interventions will be chosen based on survey responses. So I'm not going to tell you right now what we're going to do because I want to hear what the issues are first. So we've created a database of providers um, in West Virginia. Um, I say primary care providers because we're going to include not just pediatricians, but um, family care and advanced uh, practitioners, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants who are seeing a lot of our, our families throughout the state. So this is just an example of what it looks like. I have a link to the survey here. Well, drum roll, please, see if it works. <laughs> Cannot open the specified. I was afraid of that. Anyway, so we're going to ask um, a lot of uh, questions like uh, if a child comes in uh, exhibiting these behaviors, what are you likely to do next? Which of these behaviors most make you concerned for autism? When you are concerned for autism, what do you do? Do you do formal screening? Do you uh, prefer, once your kids are diagnosed, how do you serve them? What would be helpful in serving them? What was your training on autism? Did you take a course? Did you have a residency? Did you see one kid when you were in your pediatrics rotation? You know, I wish the link worked, but so some of the possible interventions that we're considering, um, there's an intervention called the Autism Navigator for Primary Care. This is a course to educate the providers on um, uh, early detection and referral. Uh, so this is an intervention at the level of the providers, the pediatricians. If they say, you know, I, never, I don't know, no one ever really trained me on this. I just kind of figured it out as I went along. Oh, it would be helpful to have some more training on it. So that might be one possible intervention. Another one that we're looking for, uh, looking at possibly using is the ESAC or the Early Screening for Autism and Communication Disorders. Uh, this is a digital and, and uh, uh, app, it can be an app where you can do it on a desktop, uh, developed at Florida State University um, that uh, it has a brief questions the questions go to the provider. 
they answer these questions um, that might look at some of those development milestones that we talked about before. It is scored automatically. Um, and then if it's positive, then lots of some specific screen questions come up. So it's sort of MCHAT like, but it's automatic and it will just bring it up for the provider to know what to ask. Um, the results then, oh, look at it, it auto corrected my EHR to her, but um, results then can be shared directly with the families and it is compatible with Epic. So it can just be uploaded into the medical record. Uh, field testing has been pretty good for both sensitivity and specificity. Um, another one developed by Florida State University is Baby Navigator. This is uh, an app, an intervention at the level of the parent. So the parent gets signed up to the app um, at when the child is born or shortly thereafter. And then it will pop up and prompt the parent and ask the parent, is your child doing this? Is your child doing this? And if red flags come up, then look <laughs> at then um, uh, uh, it's triggered to the support staff team at Florida State, who then report back to you know Dr. Smith in West Virginia to say, "Hey, Johnny's coming in next week. We're seeing concerns for autism. You might want to address this with the family." And then we want to, so once we do the intervention, we're going to circle back. We're going to re-administer the survey. Hopefully we'll see that uh, providers are more educated about autism, have a greater comfort level with dealing with this, and that referral rates have improved. And so it's sort of modeled after a study that Florida State did um, in Orlando where they used the SMART ESAC as their intervention um, and that showed that um, they upped their screening rates to 100% at the 12 and 18 month visits, and that the average age of referral for full evaluation had come down um, to 20 months. Um, so we'd like to kind of see if we can uh, replicate or show that kind of improvement here in West Virginia. Okay, so that's the primary care study. Why don't we pause? Does anyone have questions about that study? Because we're going to go to a different area now. Yeah. So what are some of those behaviors that typically people go, oh, that's what it is, but they don't know that that is autism? So, what are some of those typical behaviors that people go, and so they. they so, like they think it's autism, but maybe it's not? Yes, sir. Temper tantrums. It seems like. It really feels like these days if the child has a tantrum during their pediatrician visit, they're going to get a referral to us. And maybe it is us, uh, but maybe it's not. It could be a lot of other things. We've got a lot of um, affected families in this state with things like uh, substance use disorder, exposure to drugs in utero, non-biological families. No. Uh, challenging chaotic early family lives that has a whole impact <laughs> it's so crazy like we're that gonna, number three because when Oster's here and since she was here first i'm uh, over here intervention you're gonna stick her there help, but that's different than right autism. yeah and so it's it, there's a know. lot of confusion okay. that's some of the confusion well here so before dr anderson left we had one or two desks so this okay. would be going to the media center where my old desk used to be. Where, where and then two can they get referred up to if you're going to increase the numbers of those being referred? Right. It doesn't seem like, it seems like there's waiting lists for these kids. There are. So what I say is what I want to include. <laughs> so there are a lot of referrals sitting on our waiting list that Probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, can we send them to 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 better places? Should they would they be better seen served in behavioral medicine approach? We are also working on increasing capacity across the state. So not part of this project, but part of other things we're doing at the Neurodevelopmental Center is uh, you know trying to bring in more providers into the state, um, letting people know about other 
um, providers who are out in the state who aren't the NDC. So there's a lot of other people who can do autism evals um, and continuing to increase the capacity and the knowledge of our primary care providers. So if it's like, if it's a clear autism case, you don't need to send them for a full bang up subspecialty evaluation to get our primary care providers comfortable with saying like, oh, I'm comfortable saying this is autism. I'm gonna give you your diagnosis and get you into intervention. Like you don't have to sit around and wait for a year if for some, hopefully some of those clear cut cases. So again, it's like this multi-pronged approach um, I love that I also get to work with the LENS students because I keep saying we need to build our workforce and that is our future is all these young people. So I want to also, we're looking at expanding the neural development center across the state. I want to have jobs for these trainings when they're done. I don't want them to go to Ohio and North Carolina and Pennsylvania. I want them here. So not one answer. You had your So to, to piggyback on Lori, here at the CDB, I'd say we probably get at least one phone call a week from a family who was told that they need to get on a wait list for an evaluation, um, or they are on wait lists already and they need a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Would would the best case scenario to say like get on wait lists but get enrolled in birth to three? Absolutely. If, for that should be the first thing. Go to birth to three. I mean, that's what yeah. I, I typically do, but I don't always add in that some people in birth to three can also provide evaluations and assessments. So that might be something that would help them access. Um, well, chances are the reasons there's a reason someone is saying you should go get an evaluation. They probably have communication delays and uh, developmental delays. Like, you can go, if you have those delays, you can go get interventions for that without having a formal label. Like you have, if you have a definable delay, go address that. Don't wait for the label because really the label at that point isn't going to change the intervention. I think people feel that they need to have that label because they're told that they need to get ADA therapy. And in order to get ADA therapy, yes, that is true. Yes. Have that. And so you have um, guidance That's on how you can respond to this. I can send you, we now have a letter that because- yeah. Was it in the bus line or the bus? Back yeah, up. in the class. You have it's a letter like that you send families, you know, and, uh, and we want to get a referral. I said, we said, hey, get on the carpet. You know, it's going to be a long I said, like here everybody are some else. possibilities. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so um, we've we got a list of that. There's actually a new um, it's getting progressively telehealth-only on the diagnostic service. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I just dusted the, so I quit pumping. And dusted the dust off from us. I said, oh, my goodness. It's like a three little bag. But I'm like, you can't tell me anything. Have my pump bag, I feel like a brand new person. Keegan, would you give an autism diagnosis to get ADA then? Do you want to know? That is your diagnosis. Yeah, that's the issue with autism diagnosis. Is that the Someone's talking over you. And this is the same. You go to another state, it's going to be there. I was like, you need to sit down. ABA therapy works for I don't want to hear a word from All kinds of things, all ages, things way beyond autism. But what people get pigeonholed into here in the state of West Virginia is that West Virginia Medicaid will only pay for ABA if you have a diagnosis of autism. And then it depends on your Medicaid provider, your insurance provider. What do you need? What what do they need to accept that autism diagnosis? Do you need a formal ADOS testing? Do you need just the cars? Can a knowledgeable professional make the diagnosis without some number scored thing? If the insurance companies are the gatekeeper, and and, and I want to make that clear, it's not the providers, it's not our ABA providers trying to be, I don't know, exclusionary. This is an insurance thing. And this is where I get really frustrated because it's the, the tail wagging the dog, yeah. um, but it is the reality in which we live.
Yeah, just one thing. I'm trying to figure out how to frame this. Um, so, so part of the problem in some ways is, hey, people are sort of conflating a lot of different behaviors with autism through a series of misinformation in a lot of different ways. Is there a consideration for the way in which we're framing autism generally in terms of how us as people within the disability field, providers, medical entities, et cetera, it just feels like if people are going, hey, this is a negative behavior we don't like, and we automatically conflate it with autism. Mm -hmm. Is part of that like, you know, we're approaching it, I feel like, in a very deficit forward way, even like mm -hmm. in the, the sort of if early slides of this. Um, and, and this is lovely about, you know, but like when I you see it described as like a public health uh, uh, emergency, you know, that might be a bit of a misnomer in some ways. It feels like to me that the lack of resources is a public health emergency, that yes. a lack of accessibility measures is a public health emergency. But I think to sort of position the public health emergency and the interiority of, of potentially autistic children actually might be part of the problem in some ways. Um, because we are sort of going, hey, look out for these bad things. And then any sort of red flag that we might culturally have generally gets sort of um, uh, um, pressed on to these potentially autistic bodies. Um, I, I just wondering if there's consideration for the, the, the ways in which some of these, not just misinformation in the sense that they're not up to date on the research, but general cultural biases around what autism is or isn't is sort of maybe being taken into account here. Yeah. Um, or even just like, you know, when we when we frame questions around like um, that, one of the, the the purported values here is like um, reducing autism symptoms. Yeah, that's pretty broad in some ways, right? We're like, well, which symptoms? Because some autism, some signs of autisms aren't make Our don't need to be reduced exactly. And you, yeah. you sort of alluded to that for sure. I'm just wondering if there's if there's a sort of linguistic adjustment that that might aid in some ways in, in reducing yeah. um, these conflations. I think that's a great point. That really and and, and point well taken and, and stuff. Uh, something that I continue to try to get better on. So I will remember that for the next time. And, and one of the things, if you see me in clinic, I get passionate about that people conflate temper tantrums and autism. It shows, it makes, and I appreciate that point. In all honesty, so too often do I see that myself. So yeah. like, thank you for for that. In all honesty, yeah, appreciate it. Um. All right, I'm going to just quickly go through this dance stuff because it might try to enjoy. It uh, makes me happy. I yeah. have one more question. Um, yeah, I used to work for a birth degree, and one of the practitioners stated to me once that so many were being kids were being diagnosed with autism. She said it's just ridiculous. And has that increased because of the screening is better or? they're better at diagnosing the autism. So it, what we find is it's a lot of different things. One, I will say that your provider is looking at a skewed sample. Sure. So they are, by the very nature of their job, seeing a lot of kids with delays. So if you go to a school teacher or someone who sees, you know. But what the research shows is, yes, it's part awareness and these kind of trainings and giving uh, screenings and services. It's, you know, the public uh, perception, you know, there was a time when Autism Speaks was really big and every time you went into TJ Maxx or Giant Eagle or Kroger, there was some promotion around autism. But we also find in the research is that kids who maybe when we were young were classified as what we then called MR are now, so rates of intellectual disability, so less people used to just get diagnosed with intellectual disability are now being called autism spectrum yeah. disorder. So it's a shifting. Okay. I yeah. agree, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I thought I said that in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you apologize. Uh, <laughs> I got a question for you. Ben. So, you know, before you go into this, <clears throat> more of a statement. Hey, tell me what you think. I have noticed, so I do the mental health work here, mm -hmm. right? I see a lot of young people have been diagnosed uh, within the spectrum. And one of the things I've noticed habitually is when I get you outside and walk with you and bilaterally stimulate you, our comp and I go straight math, and I tell people, I tell Leslie all the time, I go straight math with you. Yeah. This variable plus this variable. Let's talk about those variables. And I have noticed that I did not experience. What, and what their parents are experiencing, what their teachers are experiencing. 
And so I, I'm wondering, I look at the parents one time, and they are uh, obese people. Their lifestyle is definitely not one of activity. Uh, do you think that physical activity and obesity is definitely is, is affecting this stuff? Or what, is it a cultural piece? Like, what do you? What well, do you okay. I can't speak to the obesity thing, but thanks for the segue. Oh, yes. because I got you. I should pay you later. It's pretty <laughs> I am <laughs> my research area is very much about the, yeah. the relationship of movement and cognition. Yes. Um, and there is research that shows, like say in a in kids with language delays, if you engage them in swinging or some kind of movement task, their verbal output goes up. Yes. So, hence, <laughs> a dance for all. Um, so, this is another part of what I do here in partnership with the CED. Oops. Oh, it gets hung up. There we go. Okay. So, another, pro uh, another line of work that I've been working on um, uh, started as a partnership with the WVU dance program. Um, I've been working with Maureen mansfield Kadar, who's one of the dance faculty over there. She and I attended an intensive training on dance for students with disabilities um, last February and took some of that information that we learned from that to bring to creating an adaptive dance program here in Morgantown. So last spring I had two LEN trainees who came with me and we developed the Dance for All classes. We met every Sunday um, at the rec center and uh, ran an adaptive dance class for a mixed uh, abilities class. Um, from that, we kind of learned a little bit, okay, you know, pros and cons, what are the challenges, what are the things we didn't think about and now we've developed a survey of dance studios in West Virginia because what I want to do is increase the capacity for the kids out across the state to just take a dance class at their local dance studio. So as is my way, I want to find out from the dance studio owners, are you doing this? Are you comfortable with this? What are your barriers? Why don't you do it? What would be helpful? How can we help you to do that? So that also um, is getting uh, sent out starting next week. We've got our database. And then what we want to do is from that, the results of that, develop intervention and supports for studio owners so we can increase the capacity across the state. We can't just have everyone come here to Morgantown for everything. Okay, so these are just some fun pictures of our dance classes. At the end, we held a little mini recital, and it was just as exciting as any other dance recital in town. Extended families were there. They brought flowers. We had a little reception afterwards, a little potluck reception. It was fantastic. So much fun. So, like I said, we've created a database of hopefully all the dance studios. We've developed a survey that we're getting ready to send out and to try to find what supports would help. So while we were doing this class last spring, that, and I hope this link works, this showed up on my Facebook feed um, for this documentary. The algorithm got you. It did. Ooh, will this work? Oh no! Do we have another web browser I can try to get? Yeah, here's like right. Chrome. Browser. Chrome, you might be able to. Have Chrome or the Edge? Edge or two. probably two, yeah. Oh, there you go. That was like the most cool Internet Explorer. That's excuse <laughs> 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 That's how you define it. Oh, it's cool. Yeah, see, you don't take compliments. You're like, it's cool sometimes, just not with web browsers. Oh, you know? That's yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's all we know. <laughs> who, who, okay, you. now, I didn't, did you share sound? Okay, those of you at um, home, if you can't hear this, you can see it. this is just a trailer on Amazon. Go watch it. There's no sound. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Do you like? Do you feel like I'm not normal? Because when like, I'm at school or something, I just feel really out of place. A lot of kids have been told for so long that they are different, that they believe it. I'm trying to combat that, but it's just become a fear of mine of being excluded. People tend to judge. But all kids have the ability to be successful. I see it. Arts are amazing equals. That's why I call it ballet for all kids, because in my class, they're all learning ballet. And the benefits of ballet, self-esteem, self-confidence, focus, motor skill, the list goes on and on. That's for any. But what that does to a kid who's been told their whole life that they're different and they're not as good as the rest of the world, it's miraculous. So I saw that video and I hunted her down. Mm -hmm. So the owner of the dance studio, her name is Bonnie Schlachta. She's been doing this for a long time. When they interviewed her and said the benefits of ballet are self-esteem, social interaction, communication. I want to partner with her and do the research to prove what she said. So we see this. Dance teachers describe this. We see these improvements. But believe it or not, there's no research actually showing that that happens. And this is where research innovation can come in and help prove the things which then can lead to things like, oh, I don't know, insurance company paying for these kind of interventions and things like that. So that is something that I'm working on. So one of the things we're gonna be doing is a motion capture system. So one of the ways we show that movement has improved are these fancy cameras and, and uh, reflectors and markers. You go to the RNI, it's this really cool thing. But we also found a portable system that we can use to do this. So this, oh, we'll see if this video works. So this is, what you see here is one of our lab techs. So I'm partnering with people up in engineering on the Evansdale campus. These are Velcro markers that we have placed around the body and it is communicating with a laptop to do the motion capture that you see here on the screen. So if you look in the screen behind him, it is showing what he's doing. It's portable. We can stick it in a suitcase and head to LA and teach and uh, assess Bonnie's students, do the intervention, come back 12 weeks later and show um, uh, improvements in like motor functioning, social emotional functioning, interaction, uh, and a variety of things. These are just a couple of other projects that I'm working on using a uh, virtual reality um, approach to intervention for um, kids with autism. One is I have a funded small business innovation research grant with a private company called Bismu, where we are developing a virtual reality gaming system based on dance movement therapy principles of mirroring and imitation. And then um, I also have a Disability Opportunity Fund grant with a company called Florio Inc., where we're using virtual reality-based uh, programs to teach social skills explicitly. So it might be eye gaze, eye contact, how to join uh, social interaction, how to enter a classroom. All, there's a whole variety 
of interventions. But um, I know we are about out of time. Someone asked what the name of the documentary is again. Okay. Everybody dance. Everybody dance. And then uh, there's a question from Mustafa. Do you want me to view it? And I think he could unmute. Um, he was, Mustafa, do you want to ask your question? Can you hear us? Oh. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear uh, me? Talking, but we don't hear you. Um, I. You're unmuted, but we don't hear you. Maybe your your volume. Is stop. I check my volume. Yes, I. I don't know where the problem is, but um, can you hear me now? So he did put it in the chat. He said, oh, I, um, "I can hear, I can hear Mustafa on my end." Hold on, sorry. We'd like to get advice on ways to effectively engage marginalized communities like immigrant families with children with developmental disabilities. He's starting a new study and would like to get some advice before starting. So the best way is to get people in the actual community to partner with you. So me coming in from the ivory tower, um, sorry if you can't see me, I'm whiter than white. Um, I am not going to go in and tell these families what to do. It's just not going to be as well accepted. You partner with, so what are the local communities? What are the gathering places? Is it the church? Is it the library? Or is it through the schools? Is it the grocery stores? How can you connect and partner with someone in the community to help uh, craft and how to share your message? You want to go local to uh, partner uh, with local folks. That's the best way. Question for you, yeah. That's kind of slick how you, uh, the eye contact being in virtual reality. Oh. That is so slick. How did you realize, like, I, a lot of my clients, like, after they trust me, we definitely will gaze at it, we'll talk to each other and look at each other. But how did you think, how did, how did you think, you know, we got to get people to look at each other? Like, how did you Well, so that it? comes out of classic ABA. So one of the old school ABA approaches to improve eye contact is to do uh, direct reinforcement. You know, you say, look at me. And when they look at you, you give them some kind of reinforcer, um, like an m, &M you know, and look at me, look at me. And then what some of the research showed is what happens then is people look at you. Weird. And they stare, yeah, 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 and because yeah, yeah. we don't stare at each other, we avert gaze, our eyes move around. It's much more subtle than that. Um, so the nice thing about something like virtual reality is that we can track where the eyes are looking. So one of the the early games um, for our uh, more challenged kids is uh, you have a goggles on, you go to a zoo. And it's 360. You can see it all the way around you. And you'll hear the elephant, you know, make his elephant sound. And then you have to turn and find it. And when the goggles register that you're looking at the elephant, then the elephant goes and dances. And there are lights and you get a little haptic feeling from it as well. And then it, you know, looks for some. And then it gets more complex from there as they've mastered that. Then there are... Uh, school settings where you're walking down the hall and you see another kid coming at you. Do you look at each other? And then it gets more complex from there where you're walking down the hall and there are multiple kids in the hallway and someone says, hey, and can you figure out who said it? And then, um, and it's something that, that technology can help us tell where they're looking. Um, which would be harder if I was just in the hallway with them. Like, would I know that sure. you know if they look like this? Did I just look at the door or the cabinet or the table? Yeah, that's yeah. Nice. Dude, for so it's many ages, sick. they are struggling with that. It's oh, like, VR is just exploding. Yeah, with an and there's so many yeah. adults that need that even that mm -hmm. have never had them worked with as they yeah. develop, and as adults, they still yeah. can't. So do one that. Of, one of the groups that is doing this that I'm not involved with, but they work with adults, um, and they're doing job training. Um, simulations. So, how to greet, how to enter the setting, how do you have your interview, how do you answer questions? They have a training program on how to interact with the police. Um, so, you know, yeah. 
Lots of there are three five comments. I have <laughs> no, I, I have been no, it's it's back and forth, and oh, so we've been okay. We're on. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Well, uh, Cyril, do you want to ask your question or I can list it? Are you able to unmute? Um, so she asked, do you have access to a list of dance yes. studios that are offering classes in our state, if any? That are offering so for people I don't. Autism? I have a list yeah. of dance studios. We are submitting knock on Fakewood, our IRB for the survey study on Monday. Um, we're submitting a flex. Um, and yeah, I don't currently have a list. Um, if you want to email me, if you're looking for a specific community, I have a lot of connections. Like I know some places here in Marty know do, but I don't know the outlining areas very well. Do they work on all ages? I mean, is it going to depend on the dance studio, what they offer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that, I mean, and that's a down the road kind of thing. Right now, we want to gather the information like she was asking, who's already doing this? There might be, for all I know, there's a ton of dance studios out there doing it. We don't know about it. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts about this? So I've noticed success with EMDR protocols with my students who have been diagnosed with being in the spectrum. What are your thoughts about bilateral stimulation to the brain um, in regards to symptomology? So what I would want to know, and I don't know the the research on specifically EMDR um, in autism. What I wonder though is what we know is that EMDR has shown, research has shown it to be effective in trauma responses. Yes, so do these individuals have some kind of trauma history or can we talk about small t trauma around social interactions are small t traumatic that's the part and we that's been the part it's yeah. been about the issue of value and performance so yeah. when you get people I, I found that when i get them to focus on performing and how they felt about having to perform for somebody to feel like i'm normal like i fit in that has moved and it's been very interesting but i, I was just wondering if there was any research on I don't I don't know that area. I tend to work with younger, gotcha. more impaired kids. So that's not I don't have any direct I'm experience with that. Some stuff your way, Eric, just about like it sounds like what you're describing is just the ways in which one's access needs not being met is traumatic and so, an yeah. internalized sense of ableism yes, from navigating a world that's not built for you is also traumatic. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting. Thank you. Not on any MDR yeah, specific. No, it's all good. I know what you're saying. Okay, we're, we're over. You know? <laughs> so let me really quick just to wrap for those online. And I can send um, for those in the room uh, the, the link. We'd love your input, thoughts. Um, and so this, literally, if you're online, if you see this QR code, you could put your phone up to your screen and the link will come up to fill out our survey. Please do that. Any thoughts, uh, we'll share information back with Dr. Rodonovich directly if it pertains to, you know, more information from her. Uh, but in general, oh yeah, you guys are doing it. Okay, great, great, great. Um, in general, just about the process and other topics you want to hear or just invite Dr. Rodonovich back. <laughs> we'll do that too. But thanks to everyone for, for joining us and uh, we'll follow up. If you need a certificate of attendance, Please let me know. Just send me an email, um, lcottrell at hsp.wbu.edu, and we'll get that to you. Uh, but otherwise, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.